Hi, I'm Dave Dritcher of Cosmere Festival and welcome to the second event in our 2020 online festival programme. Uh, this event is delivered in partnership with Kirklees Libraries, as are all of our author talks as part of our festival this year. So we're really pleased that you're tuning in to listen to what we're going to be talking about. The festival theme for this year is the, it's the end of the world as we know it, climate change and apocalyptic fiction. And this morning's author is perfect for that topic. We have got the wonderful Bren McDibble with Across the Risen Sea. Uh, and that's enough talking from me for now. I'm going to hand over to uh, Kirsty from Kirklees Libraries uh, to tell us about the event and to get things underway. Right, thank you, Dave. Lovely. Uh, good morning and welcome, everybody, to the second of this year's Cosmere author events. We've been very excited. We've got a great lineup, and this morning is going to be an absolute corker. I know it is. Uh, and it's a truly international sea crossing adventure this morning. We're joined today live from Australia, the first for us this one, uh, by the fantastic author, Bren McDibble. Is Bren there? Hi, Bren. Cool. Um, Bren is the author of children's books, How to Be, The Dog Runner, and Across the Risen Sea. And we've just been finding out this morning that she also writes uh, for teenagers in Australia under the name of Callie Black as well. Uh, I was introduced to Bren's books by a friend. I'm so glad she did. I absolutely loved I'll point the wrong way across the and see when we're going to be talking about today in particular. It's an absolute corky. You really need to get hold of that book. And if you do want to buy a copy, our friends of um, Cosmic Festival, a uh, read bookshop in Home Fur, are offering a 20% discount on Bren's books. Um, all you need to do is use the discount code, which I'm going to share with you at the end of the broadcast, uh, and take along to the bookshop and you're going to get your 20% discount. I'll give you their details at the end of the, the broadcast, though. So, yeah, or you can go and borrow the book from the library, of course. Yes. Um, so, uh, Bren is a multi-award winning author. We're so lucky to have her today. And The Dog Runner has been nominated for the 2020 Carnegie Medal, which is really significant over at the UK. So let's find out more and welcome Bren McDibble to Kirklees and the Cosmia Festival. Hi, Bren. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, before we get started, I'd just like to do a little acknowledgement of country, which is something we do in Australia because we all live on um, the countries of different Aboriginal peoples. And it's a tradition that you, when you have a meeting, you acknowledge the traditional owners. So I would like to acknowledge the Nanda people who are the traditional owners of the land on which I meet. And I'm coming to you from Kalbarri on the sunny west coast of Australia. Um, and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. That's lovely. Thank you, Evan. Wonderful, wonderful. So across the Risen Sea, um, I know both Dave and I have absolutely loved this book absolutely loved it and i've got Thank some you. questions that have been sent in by colleagues and from uh, from a child a young person oh my goodness, my goodness <laughs> I'm there, a young person who is has been one of the hosts for our children's reader development program she's um, actually hosted a program for us and she sent in some questions as well it's all in oh, wonderful I know, so we've got a start of a 10 question which is uh how has the current experience that we've been living in this past seven months uh, how does it make you feel about the topic that you picked for Across the Risen Sea? Um, does it make you kind of uh, wish you anything differently if you'd started the book now? Um, well, we I did have a little bit of a disease in Across the Risen Sea, which kind of like it happened once the seas rose, um, people were forced together um, and, and sort of living in makeshift housing, basically uh, refugee, refugees moving inland. And um, that kind of um, condensing, I, I created a disease um, based on seagulls. Um, seagulls have been developing bacteria because they eat all our rubbish. Um, so I kind of did that, but I don't know. Oh, what, it's, it's so hard to tell what a pandemic will be like. Like a lot of people have written about it, but nobody predicted toilet paper. Nobody. <laughs> Once people stop going to work, they stop using toilet paper at work and suddenly there's not enough to go around. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it, it's it's tricky, the things that did come true and the things that you predict. Um, yeah, nobody knows for sure until they've actually lived it, I think. Yeah, no, I think that's true. I think it would be a very strange way. If someone had put that in a book, that all oh, the toilet paper, I yeah. 
Yeah. Or that we all be locked away in our home. The, the editor would have crossed it out and said, no, that's stupid. Don't talk about toilet paper. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and I think, I know, I know we've talked about this a little bit before when I've met with you, but um, do you think you'll be responding to the pandemic in the things that you write in the future? Or is it a topic that you're thinking, no, everyone's going to be writing about this and going to avoid it? What's your... Uh, I don't think you can write about the future now and not include like 2020 and the pandemic and the, the crazy politics that's been going on. I think um, if you're writing even a contemporary novel now, you have to reference 2020 and the pandemic. Um, Zana Freilon and I, Zana writes a lot of um, stories that are quite popular around the world. Um, we were writing a story together and we started about a year ago and we've just sort of got to the end of it now. And um, unfortunately, that was about a pandemic. Um, so now we're like, we we got halfway through and the pandemic hit and we were like, oh, no, no one's going to want to read this. <laughs> this is terrible. <laughs> but we adjusted a few things. Um, uh, Zana's actually on lockdown in Melbourne as opposed to me. I'm just sort of locked down in WA where there um, it's a state lockdown but we can come and go from the cities because there's absolutely no coronavirus in our state so that is incredible we locked we've been locked down since February I think right right at or March probably right at the start with the the borders shut and we I think it was March because I had to get back home before they um, shut the borders but, um, yeah, so we've been locked down without coronavirus and, and Zana's actually locked down in her house in a, in a city with coronavirus. So it, it's, yeah, it's really, um, I don't know, it's really interesting <laughs> living through it. Um, yeah, but I think we all need to if we're, if we're writing anything set in the future, we need to reference this. It's interesting, isn't it? I know that um, I, I remember reading about a tele. Sorry, if there's a knocking at the door, if there's a delivery just come to the door. Real life happens, working from home, we just have to <laughs> breathe deeply. Yes. Um, but uh, I was reading about a television series, which is uh, they've just managed to get the last episodes so filmed and then broadcast. And then they were deciding that they were going to skip, skip and not mention and just kind of pitch what happens next without having to try and deal with. So it's interesting how many different it will be. A, it'll be a choice, won't it? Whether you actually incorporate it into the story and, and just acknowledge it's happened, or it's how do you? Yeah. How do you, you know, I don't know. How it's did you, yeah. How did you deal with twenty twenty? Um, yeah, yeah. I suppose if we go far future, we'll kind of treat it like um, Spanish flu. We never mention that, do we? So true. Oh, so. We've spoken a lot more now than we've ever have. Yeah. Yes. Before. Now we do. <laughs> Okay, anyway, right, so that was just some stuff for 10, some warm-up questions there. Oh, so, uh, am uh, I getting them right so far? <laughs> oh, of course, there's no wrong. There's no wrong. Um, well, some of the questions I've had um, from colleagues who have read Across the Risen Sea, um, I love this one. So um, she loved, She says she loved the way that, now, is it Neoma? Am I saying, saying that right, Neoma? Yeah, I say Neoma. I think it's actually mm. Greek, and they would say, um, well, what would that, Neoma. Yeah. Mm. But I say neoma because I, I wanted it to rhyme with neo. <laughs> New. Yeah. So, yeah, she loved the way neoma was independent and so skilled at sailing. Uh, her question was, do you think we overprotect and stifle children now? Oh, yeah, I, I think it's hard to say. I mean, it depends where you live. Um, in the cities, you, you kind of need to keep your eye on your kids and and what they're doing and what they're up to and that's unfortunate but it's absolutely true but um outside my window <laughs> yesterday there was a 12 year old and a four-year-old having um a great big um sword battle with <laughs> planks and bamboo and cardboard boxes for shields and then not an adult in sight and they were just going gung-ho and i'm like oh my god the kids here are tough um, and down at the local pub, they have a whirly gig and they have a concrete wall around the outside and a sand pit for the kids to fall in. But if it gets going fast enough, the kids slide off and, of course, hit the concrete wall. So the pub has gone and put tape around it, <laughs> like warning tape, black and yellow tape. And I'm like, that's not going to protect their heads. <laughs> that's just like, hey, I'm a wall. <laughs> 
<laughs> so I think in the country, country Australia anyway, kids are just getting up to all sorts. They all have little motorbikes. They're out in the bush um, dirt biking around. I mean, there's snakes. There's all sorts of things that will bite you out there. Um, but in a city, I think we're more... I think we're more aware of um, looking after our children, making sure that they they understand the world before they enter it. I mean, you can talk to a five-year-old about not going near a snake and what to do if they get lost. Um, but you can't really talk to a five-year-old about what to do if a stranger approaches you, can you? So it's kind of, it's a different world. So I think, I don't want to say that we're being too overprotective. But I think kids do need to just, if they're city kids, take them out to the bush, let them run wild, get them out in the parks, let them climb trees and have fun. Um, they're not allowed to climb trees at school. The teachers tell them to get down because it's all health and safety in the workplace. But um, just get your kids out into the wilderness whenever you can and let them build up those, uh, I don't know, dam creeks and dig holes and learn and, and play out in the wild because, you know, <laughs> it's good for them. Well, yeah, and obviously the skills that um, that you talked about in Across the Risen Sea are all things that uh, that you just described are things that you yeah. know, when a post-apocalyptic situation happens are the things that then become useful, not in my tablet or things like that, but it's actually how yeah. to start a fire, all those sorts of things. So uh, Start a fire, catch a fish, um, yeah. swim, yes. swim's good. Yes, yes, absolutely, yeah. especially in Across the Risen Sea. I'll put it the wrong way, Across the Risen Sea. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, so one of the other questions. I mean, there are some wonderful, char wonderful, wonderful characters in the Cross the Risen Sea. Uh, I, there's a few that we're going to mention as we're going through, but um, the wild animals, which are <laughs> characterful in themselves. I mean, Uncle Croc. Um, yeah, everybody I mean, loves the Croc the best. Me, I got who tends just to be, you know, I'm just a plank. I'm just a plank. I'm not here. I'm not here. That's my. <laughs> yeah. So funny. Uh, and of course, the shark that just never gives the up. Shark. Um, yeah. The shark. And I, if I didn't know what to do, I just brought the shark back. I was like, hmm, <laughs> time for the shark to come back. Oh, the shark was a horse. I see. <laughs> I, I see. I was like, totally. <laughs> so one of the other questions I've had sent in is, how close have you ever been to a crocodile or a shark? Oh, um, how close have I been to the crocodile or a shark? Um, let me see. I've seen them certainly on the beaches and run the other way. Because <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I've, I've, I've travelled right around Australia for the last two years. I've been living in a bus. And, of course, um, once you go, I don't know, four or five hours north of Brisbane, you start getting into saltwater crocodile country and they're all on the beaches. So when you go to the beach, you're looking for a croc. And there's beaches you can't swim at because um, the crocs will come. They will come in once they see you swimming and they'll come along the beach. So, yeah, um, I went on a, I went in the Daintree and I hopped on a boat and we went up the Daintree River and that got pretty close to crocs. So uh, those, um, the saltwater crocodiles in Australia, they can go up the rivers as well. They go um, possibly 200 kilometres inland. So, yeah, so, and the, um, there's a type of shark that also comes up rivers as well because he likes to eat pig and sheep and goat and all sorts of stuff. So, the, yeah, I don't think I've been in the sea and felt a shark near me, though. That would be terrifying. I'd be absolutely terrified because they're the kind of animal that, even if they don't eat people, they like to nibble to see what you are. Like they don't look, I don't know, are they blind? They just nibble. And, um, yeah, getting nibbled on some, with something with sharp teeth is very, very bad for you. So, um, yeah, I've seen them. Um, I fed sharks in, um, we went up into the Catherine and we hand fed sharks that were wild sharks that had been coming to this sort of houseboat that was anchored there and they fed them and talked about them. And you, you could get in a cage beside them and they would swim around you and then you could feed them. But they were kind of bottom dwellers. So, and they still snapped like that to get the food, but they were all kind of gummy because all they did was sort of 
graze crustaceans from the bottom. So they were like, ah, ah. But, yeah, yeah. So I've been pretty close on tours, but I don't think I've ever been completely in danger. Um, it's really interesting because obviously uh, uh, being based in Australia of the kind of the future, that you're able to bring in these kind of uh, really exotic to us, to us. In, in yeah. The, you know, we don't walk down and see, oh, there's the crocodile. Um, I'm the thinking with global warming, they'll all head further south in Australia once the waters warm up mm -hmm. because there's this constant battle now for the sea wild, um, saltwater crocs for territory. They're constantly battling over territory. And in summertime, the younger ones will come south and then it will get too cold and they'll head back north in winter. But, yeah, I think if there's global warming, we'll see a lot of animals we don't normally see. Interesting, interesting. Um, so I've got another one. Uh, Dave, you've got any questions? You just build. You want to? Well, jump in? Yeah, well, I was going to say uh, Crocs was interesting for me because of that they are so hardy and they they survived, mm. you know, millions of years of global mm. catastrophe. So they felt like a really good choice for this story because they'll just keep on going and keep. Yeah, on and if they get a big gash or something or lose a leg. They have such an amazing body. They fight off the uh, um, bacteria and then infection and they'll just carry on with three legs or a big gash in the side of their head. And it's like, woo, they just keep going. So that's heartening. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's why the pirate and the... Oh, we're coming on to the pirate in a second. Oh, I love that character. Um, so another question I've had it in is, uh, and if anyone, if anyone watching wants to send any questions in, I should say, just uh, put in the chat box and we can, we can feed them through to Brad. So please do get involved. Um, so where did you get your inspiration for the Valley of the Sun, the floating gardens at sea or the cities at sea? Ah, oh, um, I just thought it would be amazing because have you ever been on those cruise boats? They're huge. They are like floating cities. Yeah, and yeah. if you started putting them together, um, and I don't know if you could lash them together. It is fiction. Um, <laughs> but if you, yeah, if you started putting them together, um, you could basically make a huge city on the sea. Um, and I often think that they're, they're scrapping a whole pile of cruise boats at the moment. I'm thinking, well, there's all these homeless people who are being flooded out of their homes and everything. And why couldn't they lash a few of these cruise boats together and, and move into them or, or create more hospitals on cruise boats or something? But, yeah, um, yeah, I just, they are floating cities individually. So if you start putting them together, you could make a huge, you know, huge, huge. thing. Yeah. Huge. Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, so, yeah, we're on Pirate Bradshaw now. Um, who, <laughs> who read the book or are still just kind of looking thinking is, is, is she really gone is she just going to pop up somewhere else with a knife in her teeth and you know I uh, love that character fabulously scary was how the, my colleague could describe her wonderful um, <laughs> and she just wondered whether are there any irrepressible women that influenced the creation of Pirate Bradshaw oh I don't know <laughs> um I, I think it's just sort of based on, you know, movies like Alien. With, um, <laughs> the main character is like constantly coming back and <laughs> fighting the alien. It's kind of just a, a, a very sci-fi trope, I think, is to have the, the invincible woman. But in this case, it's a bit of a, an annoying bad woman. <laughs> Annoying bad woman. That's a bit of an annoying bad woman, but unkillable. And um, when Selesi keeps saying to Neoma, oh, don't cross her, she's unkillable. And Neoma's thinking, oh, well, she's fallen in the sea in the jaws of a crocodile, she won't be back. But Selesi's like, well, you have to wait for her to come back or she'll be mad. She's like, no, she can't come back. But um, yeah, you can't kill her. <laughs> apparently not. Apparently not. Wonderful. Um, do you like that kind of freedom then that writing that kind of fantasy or kind of like speculative fiction gives you rather than having to be kind of well I'm writing a realistic novel this is how I have to because this is what happened. yeah yeah I wrote how to be and I wrote the dog runner quite realistically um and prior to that I'd written a lot of um science fiction that was way out there and then when I got to across the risen sea I thought you know I want to incorporate more fun 
I want creatures that are just on the edge of doing strange things and I want a pirate hag who's unkillable <laughs> and I want, you know, the, the floating city and all the, all the fun stuff. So I started incorporating that in and it was just, yeah, it was just a lot of fun. And I thought, and th there's kind of a push now to not be so dire and and realistic. And I thought, you know, this is this is probably going to um, sit, sit a lot better in the in the current pandemic times with people when they can look at something and think, yeah, maybe that's not real because sharks don't do that or yeah. pirate hags don't exist or something. Yeah, I but it also it was... could happen. <laughs> I think I have a flavour of kind of Greek myth for me, not just because of the sea voyages, but those kind of monsters in the deep and the kind of unkillable villains and everything. It was really nice to bring that into the story, I thought. Yeah, yeah. I, I've sort of like, yeah, just brought it in a little bit so it's almost believable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so, 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 so the, the end of the world kind of a post-apocalyptic kind of novels. Um, there's always an interesting question for the, for the writers and I think for the reader as well, you try to kind of measure who do you think you would be? So that kind of, um, there's all these different ways of coping and reacting and who will you be? So one of the questions that uh, someone sent in is, uh, would you think be more like um, sort of brave Neoma who kind of just charges straight in, you know, not even at the consequences or would you be more of a kind of cautious jag kind of character? who kind of thinks things through and a bit more thoughtful? So do you, can you see yourself in any of the uh. characters? I think when I was younger, I would be more like Neoma and just charge through and just do things and see what happens. <laughs> but I think as I get older, I'm a bit more cautious. <laughs> so now I'd be probably more like Jag and be a little bit more cautious. But I think when I was younger, I was, you know, I never had time to think. I'd just go and do stuff. <laughs> I wasn't very bright and um, I get into a lot of trouble. <laughs> so I think I used to be Neoma, yeah. but I'm, I'm, I'm slowly getting a little bit smarter. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Um, oh, and then uh, the colleague just added that she found Jack's courage when he took the blame for Neoma very moving. She thought it was a very moving part when he took the blame for um, for, for taking down the, the wiring. Um, she thought it was very moving and kind of, kind of overcomes that kind of fear to be too brave, but in a... Kind of yeah, cool to help someone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. So, <laughs> this, is, this is full of compliments. You, you should read this. Read the, read the comments. <laughs> Absolutely lovely. Um, so uh, let's see what we've got next. Oh, oh, oh yes, there's a question. So yes, so um, with that kind of um, with the kind of the, the, the people they start to meet and the, and the polls they put in, and then when um, Naomi gets to burn, try not to give away too much of the detail, people. You really should read the book. Um, but when Naomi gets burnt, was, if that, was that a read? There was a query about what that was. Was that? Do you think it was radioact radioactive? That what, yeah, what, I was. Yeah, I trying to imply it was some sort of um, future radioactive power source that kind, you know, the kind that never goes out. Um, yeah. But yeah, and it should have been buried in a in a box. But of course, mm. she dug it up. <laughs> <laughs> With a bare hand, why not? Why not? Um, so one of the questions we've got is, um, so when you write, because obviously there's really big uh, themes hidden, not hidden, within, within across the risen sea. Um, so when you write, I mean, you've talked about how um, you make it lighter and there's this fun in this book, and there is a lot of fun in this book, but there's some, there's some messages here which, um, which are really important. So when you're writing and you're kind of incorporating books that have messages as well, are you hoping that your reader will kind of be inspired to think differently or act differently as a result? What, or do you just write the book and just hope they enjoy it? How do you, is there a mixture of two? Um, I include the themes that I'm interested in. Um, so I think Neoma's, um, Neoma's trying to live a gentle life with her, her village. They all try to live gently. They don't want... Um, they don't want all the trappings of modern society because that leads to pollution. So I, I'm thinking, you know, how would we live if we lived gently and we didn't have all those trappings? And they reuse and they recycle and they use um, old batteries and they use solar panels and stuff like that. Um, whereas some of the other people in the islands won't even use that old technology that they're recycling on this island. But 
they're just trying to live really low impact lives and trying to keep the trees growing and, and not burn the wood and that kind of stuff. So when I sort of present that, I guess I'm exploring the things I'm interested in. And I'm writing, I think, for a reader who also wants to explore that, what that life might look like, rather than um, trying to say, do this or do that. I think I'm just exploring and seeing what happens. And I think it's interesting for other people who are interested in that kind of thing, just to read it. So it's it's basically, you know, it's a backdrop to the main plot. I'm not, I haven't got a plot around live more gently and the world will be better because obviously it's different. Um, and the, the planet is um, different, the seas are risen and, and, and stuff. And the, um, the, the, sh the Valley of the Sun are kind of using more technology and stuff like that. So they're not, and, and other people are in cities with walls around. So it's just these country people who have been left to fend for themselves and who have decided off their own backs to live more gently upon the sea and, and that kind of thing. Yeah, so I'm, I'm just exploring and I think it's good to explore and I think other people are interested in that. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a quote I'm going to the forward. <laughs> Your dog. <laughs> Someone Absolutely. should make that dog stop barking. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, there's a forward to the book, which I love, which I'm going to share with everybody. Um, I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, yes, it says, to everyone trying to live more gently on this earth, keep up the good work, which I loved. I yeah. love that at the beginning of the book. I thought it set the tone really nicely for it. So I, I think Yeah. Yeah, everybody tries a little bit and um, sometimes we just don't feel like we're getting anywhere. Yeah. But um, I think we just need to keep up the good work and keep trying. I like that. I liked it. It wasn't, um, yes, it wasn't hammering at home. It was just kind of, I like that, live more gently on this earth. I guess more yeah. um, so yes. Anyway, so let me go back to my questions. Um, so, um, yes, yeah, so, um, sorry, let me get questions back. Um, so, um, so for children then, um, first of all, you write for children and young people, um, is that a deliberate um, aim for yourself or is it uh, an age group that you find most interesting to write for? Why children and young people? I'm always interested why people. Um, um, I think it's, a, it's an inquiring age um, and they're always really interested in, in exploring and finding stuff out. Um, they're also, they read a lot. Um, and they're sort of open to, to fun ideas and, and uh, yeah, basically exploring. And I think um, when I was that age, I was really worried about um, a future with um, if the atomic bomb went off because, of course, if it goes off, it's probably going to go off in the northern hemisphere and I live in the southern hemisphere and um, you guys will be gone instantly, but what is it going to look like for us for months of slow death or whatever and I was there was nothing there was no answers what might happen what what would happen and that's the kind of the age I was where um, possible climate change affected me in that way all that constant worrying and wondering and nobody stopped it um, and I think I can see young people who are 10 11 12 doing the same thing now they can see the climate changing, they get worried, they want answers, they want to explore what future might look like, they're wondering why nobody stops it again. So I think it's just it's just come that I just sort of have an understanding of what they're going through. And yeah, not no one person can stop it. But I think if I write about it, then they have, they can explore what a future might look like, but also they can talk about it and um, talk about it within a safe space, talk about fiction, talk about Neoma and how she's coping, rather than um, talking about how they would cope or how their family would cope, which is a bit close to home. So talking about how Neoma might cope, lets them keep on talking about it because we, we kind of need to, keep people thinking and talking about it because that's the only way we're going to to find solutions and 
when humans encounter huge problems, they just sort of go, oh, well, there's nothing we can do. It's too big. It's too vast. And they stop talking about it. But I think young people, um, it's, it's not an issue they can do very much about. So why not talk about it in fiction so they can keep trying to understand it and talk about it? Yeah. Yeah, so it's a very interesting answer. <clears throat> yeah, things we've been talking about earlier about, yeah, that this um it gives them a space in which they can take yeah. ideas out as well, see see where they can see their future, I suppose, as well, for them their individual lives as well. Yeah, they can they can imagine how they might cope if they were Neoma rather than mm -hmm. you know, worrying about, you know, do we need a seawall around Newcastle or <laughs> Is it actually your castle rather than our Newcastle? <laughs> <laughs> Both Newcastles are on the sea, aren't they? <laughs> um, my brother's in Thetford. I think that's pretty low. <laughs> yeah, but it's pretty low in the ground. There's a lot of bog. All right. Might need to see one. <laughs> right, okay. I'm wondering whether, Bran, if you're up for it, could we have a, would you mind be able to do a quick reading for us? from a, a I can do that. I can do that. I'll read the, the opening chapter. Brilliant. Thank you. And um, do, you want to, do you want the close-up camera on you? Or do you want to <laughs> stay like this? You've got a choice. I can take us out so you can just be brave. I can do that. Oh, no, no. Stay there. Stay there. Okay. <laughs> Don't leave me alone here. It's very scary. <laughs> okay. This is the first chapter of Across the Risen Sea. It's called This Off Day. And this little fish. There's lots of little beautiful illustrations and stuff throughout this, um, all done by Joe Hunt, who's an, um, a book designer in Australia. It's one of them days when everything is off. A hot, sweaty night in Rusty Bus means we kids is all grouchy tired. Little Lees wake up whining and pushing, arguing over whose clothes is whose. Little Margie clings to my shirt tail so hard I can't work her fingers open and I have to drag her all the way to the loo with me. Me and my best friend Jaguar head to the beach, trying to cool down by taking turns at dipping in the sea pool. Him standing on the seawall on lookout for crocs, me swimming, then we swap places. We always do things as a team, him and me. We's gonna be the best fisher people and the best salvages on the whole of the inland sea one day. The dawn mist is sitting low, not a gust of wind to blow it or the mozzies away. Days buzzing at my ears whenever I come up for air. I'm slapping at one when Jag sets up whining like a newborn puppy and leaps off the seawall into the water with me. Splashing and gasping, his eyes wide and wild, he yells, Neoma, run! He scrambles out onto the beach and takes off, just, just leaving me there. I know he's unnaturally afraid of crocs, but this is silly. We's meant to be a team, I yell after him. His shorts must have torn on the sea wall, because all I get in answer is one hilarious pale butt cheek sliding up and down in a corner tear in his shorts as he gallops up the beach. Jag, I shout and scramble out of the sea pool, all splashes and pumping legs up the beach. I turn back once I got a head start on that croc or whatever. I want to know what's got Jag so messy. He's regularly afraid of stuff, but he never up and leaves me to face it alone. A pale pink head pokes up over the edge of the seawall. It's a baby, a tiny baby head pulling itself up out of the water and onto the seawall made from old car frames and rocks. I head back down to the beach to help it. Who left a baby in the water? Lucky it didn't drown. The baby keeps climbing, revealing more of itself over the rusty metal and rock. It ain't got no hair and it's unnaturally pink like it got soaked in hot water, not cool sea. Then a pair of bright blue eyes is looking at me. There's a tuft of green sea moss stuck on its ear. Its nose is tiny and there's pink flower bud lips just below that. Then its chin shows and just below something that makes me want to scream and run too scuttling crab legs this baby's got crab legs instead of a body my heart shoots to thumping flat out and my feet stagger back from this crawling nightmare until my bad sleep head tells me babies can't have crab legs for bodies but crabs can take anything for shells 
It ain't a real baby head, but a doll head. One of them dolls that looks like a real baby. The crabs found it in a drowned house somewhere on the risen sea. It's got its own bit of salvage. I laugh, which comes out a bit squeaky. And then I whistle up to the littlies. Come and be witness to what's jerky walking along our seawall, happy as can be. A baby head crab house. Jag comes creeping back down with the other kids, hanging on to his shorts at the back, hopefully, because he's noticed the hole, not for any messier reason. <laughs> All the littlies, even those still hot and sleepy with puffy eyes, laugh and try to be brave, even though it's a terrible, terrible sight, that jerky walking crab baby. Little Margie wants to chuck rocks at it, but I tell her, no, bad enough. That crab can't find a decent shell house to carry around. Now you want to go and smash the only one it could find? We's all down there on the beach, laughing off our fear, when an aluminium-hulled boat with a bright yellow sun on the prow comes sliding out of the mist. What a day. Maybe I'm having one of those sweaty sleep dreams that seems so real. Three tall people wearing shiny headbands is in the boat. They dock. And before the first long leg stretches for the jetty, the littlies scatter like scared roos. Me and Jag run and hide too behind a car body cottage. The three strangers hoist large black bags over their shoulders and stride through the village straight up Cottage Hill like they's the most important thing around. More important than us, more important than our elders even who come out of their huts and cottages, their silver hair shining in the early morning sun, shouting, You there! What do you think you're doing here? The rest of us seen them shiny bands of gold around their heads with the big gold front sun on the front, seen their smooth jet back hair, seen their fine clothes. The rest of us is too scared to say a word to them. Do you want me to finish the chapter? It's another page. The page. I, I think we could leave it. Do we think we leave it there? I like that. <laughs> Hanging because I'm like, oh, oh David, David, I'm going to argue about this. We just enjoy being read to. <laughs> We're quite happy to sit and listen to someone reading. Oh, oh, I know. Everyone likes being read to. Oh. <laughs> oh. And uh, I have to say, because uh, when I started reading it, when you, when you start reading and you can hear that it's it's in an accent, you can hear something you know written in an accent. I'm trying when you're reading to have, so it's lovely having someone reading it. <laughs> I was imagining in my head. It's lovely to hear that. Brilliant. I don't have an accent. What are you talking about? <laughs> Do I? <laughs> and when I, when I got to the when I got to the end, it felt to me this could easily be that she's telling this story round a camp, not a campfire, but round a, a gathering to kids to kind of. So maybe it's not exactly what happened, and things are exaggerated. But I like that feel of it that it's like an oral history kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, it's really told in a really um, personable style, not formal formal writing language so yeah it does lend itself to that yeah no it's, it's lovely it's lovely but you can really and it helps find that character as well Naomi you can really hear her through the through the how she how she's yeah. talked in the in the story it's lovely it's a lovely way of doing it cool so um can we talk about your uh, journey to becoming a writer ah oh there's a lovely there's a lovely oh, hold on we've had a lovely comment come up from uh I'll just show it up for you from old barn books Oh, yeah. ah, <laughs> in the that's UK. My <laughs> Hi, Ruth. <laughs> it's probably Ruth. <laughs> but it, but it was absolutely lovely. Um, so, um, so your journey to becoming a writer. We, when we've um, we do work with uh, children, young people, um, and we encourage them to to use writing um, as a way of kind of dealing with what's going on in their lives, or just uh, exploring their kind of creativity. So it's always really interesting to hear how a published author. Uh, what their journey was to becoming a published author really i suppose well, what yeah. was your uh, um so what was your journey yes why how um, how are you today well when i was young i think i was just pretty good at english and then we were always in um small country schools so you would have three or four grades per class um and once you'd hit the top you hit the top there was no nothing else on offer so if you were good at writing and spelling or whatever, you just got told to go look up 10 words in the dictionary and use them in a sentence, basically. So that was basically my primary school. I didn't do a lot of writing. I don't remember doing a lot of writing. In high school, um, 
I didn't do a lot of schoolwork, but I did do a lot of writing when I was meant to be studying to entertain myself. So I did a lot of writing in high school, um, but I did fail my school certificate English. So I possibly should not have been writing stories to entertain myself. <laughs> I should possibly have been actually studying. Um, <laughs> And then I left school and I left it all behind for years and years. Um, and it wasn't until I was reading books to my own children when they were small that I started getting really enthusiastic about books. Um, books had like, um, they'd changed, they'd become so much more fun. And I was getting really excited going, oh, I used to be able to write quite well. Maybe I can still do it. So I went and did a few night classes and stuff when the kids were small. Um, and yeah, the, the teacher said, oh, you, you've got quite a quirky style. You should probably keep going. So I kept going and I did a lot, of, a lot more courses. But it's, it's really hard. Um, yes, yeah, so I spent about 18 years in the wilderness just doing courses and not getting good enough to get a, a novel deal. Um, I did a whole lot of um, chapter books. Um, these are little tiny, really skinny. These are like first chapter books that you'll see in schools. Um, so this company, they're funny little chapter books with beautiful illustrations. But these are what children in Australia read before they progress to novels. And, and you can see it's got chapter headings and beautiful little pictures and stuff absolutely gorgeous so I got about 12 of those published um, so I was getting published which kept me going thinking oh one day I'll get the big novel deal and um, it took me about 18 years and then I started deciding that um, courses weren't going to help me anymore so I started really learning how to evaluate what other authors were doing and just um like really picking apart their processes just by reading a lot so read 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 and then read really critically that's what I started doing um and that actually helped me try to understand what other authors were doing when they were playing with language and playing with my emotions and all sorts of other things and that was when I started to improve and then I wrote this massive novel in the Dark Spaces as a, a play novel for young adults. And I tried out voice and I tried out everything that I love in a novel. And it won um, a first novel prize with uh, Hardy Grant Egmont in Australia. And at the same time, How To Be was sitting at Alan and Unwin and they wanted to publish that as well. So I went from nothing for 18 years except these li really lovely little chapter books they go to direct to marketed to schools and then all of a sudden two trade novels immediately and I'm like oh <laughs> this is this is crazy um and then the dog runner got picked up and across the risen sea and then old barn books in um the UK they found how to be and loved it and had a go with it and um people in the UK just they knew so much more about bees and insects than they did in Australia. It took off much more quickly in the UK than it did in Australia. Um, in Australia, uh, there's a whole pile of diseases that haven't made it here for bees. So the bees are not quite suffering as much as they are um, in the Northern Hemisphere. So it, it's, it, I don't know, it was timely, I think. Um, there was a whole lot of bee stuff going on. At that time, and a lot of other people were writing stories about bees, so it was quite a popular topic that year. So I was very, very lucky that it took off. Yeah. So that was my journey. <laughs> and uh, you mentioned the ones that, that I was going to ask about top tips, and I'll come back to that. But you mentioned something that so many authors that we've had coming on our um, Library Ventures Live have mentioned about how important it is to read, read, read before you start to yeah, really find your writing voice. But yeah, great. Yes. Yeah. Um, so for those that haven't, people haven't read um, How to Be and The Dog Runner, um, would you like to give us just a brief, uh, just a quick pricey of both of the books for us? Okay. okay, so How to Be is uh, set in a time in the future when there are no bees. And 
um, the children of the poor people, um, poor people have been evacuated from the cities and their children, the children who are light and supple and agile, run around through the trees hand pollinating the flowers. And it's about one little girl who loves her orchard, loves living on the orchard and her mother takes her to the city to be a maid. And she's not happy about that. And she's possibly even more outspoken than Neoma. So she's <laughs> definitely not into that. Um, the dog runner. Um, this one is about a time in the future where it's less in the future. So it's, you know, maybe 10 years in the future. Um, and all the grass has died. Um, a grass fungus has wiped out all grass, which is wheat, oats, rice, sugar, rice, corn. Um, so there are no grass and no grass for dairy animals and no grass for meat. So there's this massive famine has started. And this family, their hobby is um, sledding, dog sledding, which, of course, in Australia do on wheels. And so they... Um, the the mother is away the father's gone to get the mother who she's a, an essential worker she's stuck at the power site he goes to get her because they need to get out of the city and go up country to visit to go stay with family because the the city's out of food um he doesn't come back and so there's just this little girl ella and her brother um emery and they decide to take the dogs and go alone uh with these big dogs to get out of the city and go up country um yeah, so it's just about their journey to to get away from the city and head up country and stay safe and look after their dog family as well. Strong, resourceful children. That seems to be yeah, their character. Awesome. Like Ella, Ella's, yeah. Ella is the character who starts off very um, unsure and scared and she develops a strength along the way. So that was that's a bit different to Neoma and this one's Peony. All the children are named after fruit and flowers in that book. So, oh, lovely. Um, May, our um, our uh, young host who's hosted one of our other sessions, uh, one of the questions she wanted, she'd read how to how to be, and one of the questions she wanted to ask was, um, "Have you ever worked on a farm yourself?" It must be so. Oh, I was I was raised on farms. Um, my parents were farm labourers, so uh, we moved all over central north island of new zealand because i'm a new zealander which i haven't uh, my accent changes and when i'm in australia it's australian and when i'm in new zealand it's new zealand accent so um we lived all over the central north island and we moved around a lot um and we were always farming and mostly it was um sheep and cattle and um a few crops but um we it also ended up in high country sheep farms so hill mountains and hills and stuff and living sort of quite remotely yeah so mostly i know animals i know orchards because i was always hungry as a child and i used to sneak into the orchards <laughs> and take the fruit <laughs> and peony would hate me for that but that's true <laughs> That's what we do. Oh, there we are. May must have picked up on that. She must have uh, from reading the book. I know the question she um, sent through was, um, if you weren't a writer, um, what career might you have um, done instead? That's what she was asking. Ah, look, I, I was never educated. So all my careers have been sort of in offices and stuff, um, working in offices, but I've always wanted to do something creative. So I tried art a lot when I was in high school. I did a lot of art and stuff and modeling and modeling, clay modeling and that kind of stuff. Um, but I could never find the thing that I was good at. Like I'd get, I'd, I'm mediocre at art, mediocre at painting, mediocre at drawing. And I mean, that's pretty good. A lot of people can't draw, but like, I couldn't find the thing that I was really, really good at. And then, yeah, writing, it's kind of like painting because you build up layers as you edit. You build up layers of paint and you you change the texture of the story as you're writing. And it, it feels really a lot like painting to me. It's really creative. But um, 
I don't know. I wanted when I was at school, I broke a lot of bones when I was a child and I wanted to be a radiologist because they were so nice to me, always putting me in the X-ray machine. And I thought, I'll be a radiologist, but then I couldn't really do maths. So I was going to uh, <laughs> I like that. <laughs> oh, bless. Um, of all the answers, I bet you would not have guessed radiologist. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm obscure. <laughs> I did want to join the circus, though, and like ride horses bareback and stand on their backs and stuff, but I wasn't that good at that either. <laughs> it's the broken bones. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, there are many of us, or, uh, us out there that are. Oh, bless. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Wonderful. Dave, did you have any other questions for Brent? Um, the, the thing that really occurred to me, because I've been reading a lot of books about apocalypses for the festival, mm. which is, you know, it's been a cheery year. <laughs> um, something that I really like about this kind of story is that normally when you're reading something fantastical, you know nothing about the world and the character then and the story shows you that world. But I think in stories like this, um, you in some ways you know more about the world than the character does. Because you yeah. you, kind of, you know about the world before um, in yeah. a way that they don't, and so you you kind of yeah. ahead of the game. So I wonder if that was something that you you liked in fiction that you read, and that and that it it fed its way into this story. Oh, I like. I'm trying to think if I've read anything where they've done that. Um, I don't know. I don't think I have read anything. I can't think of, can you think of any titles? Well, they, I'm, reading, I'm, also reading world this the, I'm reading this at the moment, which is yeah. um, the, by M.R. Carey, which is set quite close to here in the future. Yeah. So again, the, the technology is all kind of failed and the characters don't really know how the world used to be. So you. Yeah, I guess there's a lot of YA where they don't understand. Yeah. Like um, our Veronica Roth story set in a ruined Chicago. They never talk about why Chicago is ruined and why the trains still run, or even though it's ruined. And they never talk about that. So, I guess what I wanted to do was, I mean, I'm dealing with ten-year-old characters, and the world changed before they were born, mm. and they they hear rumors about what it used to be like, but they don't know for sure. So it's not part of what they know. And because I do sort of a, a really um, deep point of view like I never say anything the character can't know and I never use words that the characters don't know because they're only 10 they've never been to school um, so there's a lot of words they don't know um, so I re I'm really trying to just be really tight on that one character's point of view so I really can't go giving background no. to yeah, how things changed or what changed or what it was like at the at the point of change because, yeah, these two are set so far in the future. This one, um, Ella did actually go to school and she's a keen reader as well. So she knows a little bit more about the, the current world and how the situation evolved, yeah. I just think it works really nicely that, that you're going on an adventure with the characters but also you're kind of, because you're ahead of them, you're, yeah, you're seeing them go on an adventure at the same time, and that's a nice thing. To and and another about. thing, when adults read these books, they are more terrified <laughs> for the children than when children read the books. Like Peony goes, she runs away in the middle of a city, which is full of hungry poor people, um, and adults are worried for her. But because she's just like, I know the way back to the farm. I'm going, um, and the young readers believe her because she's really strong and they believe that Peony's going to be okay because Peony's strong and she she does this stuff um but adults are like there's no way a nine-year-old should be wandering around that town that city's <laughs> dangerous it's a really dangerous city there's you know there's barbed wire and all everybody's fences to keep people out so adults often worry more and and adults will often say that um Peony's not being paid to work on the orchard because they work there for free and in return they get a safe place to live and they get some food given to them. Um, and, you know, they're all happy with that and, and they sort of resource hand-me-downs and second-hand goods and stuff like that from the city are given to them sometimes. And they sort of just sort of eat together a living. But, yeah, the children aren't paid. And a lot of people go, oh, that's slavery. And I'm like, but 
Penny doesn't understand that. She thinks it's a fair deal. She's not hungry on the streets of the city. She's got a nice little shack in an orchard where she works and she's important. So, yeah. But, yeah, adults bring something completely different to the story than kids. So if an adult reads it and goes, oh, children shouldn't be reading this, they're, they're reading it at a different level. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, I think these are absolutely, I think, and, and the children that we know that read them love them, absolutely love them. And I, yeah. I saw Jack in an email that um, the schools are doing the dog runner, doing, I have uh, introduced the children to the dog runner. Uh, so, um, if there's anybody watching who's been doing the dog runner at school, you must get, I keep pointing the wrong way, across <laughs> the river and see. Go on to that one, guys. You're going to absolutely love <laughs> As I, I love the humor. It's the humor that, that just lifts it as well and makes it a, like, like like Dave was saying, that kind of epic kind of storytelling kind of arc where she's going off on a journey and these extraordinary adventures, brilliant, but also with a very real message coming through as well about yeah, yeah. we can do it, now. So, something yeah. to think about anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely, which is which is, which is is what you want from a book, isn't it? Something to yeah. chew over afterwards as well as having had a good giggle yes. or a bit, of a, a bit of an exciting story as well. I think it's yeah, a little bit of an explore and something to think about. I, I don't have the answers. <laughs> who has the answers i don't know <laughs> and talking like you said earlier then that's that's the best place to start from it so yeah. that's the keep that, talking it? that's the only answer i know is keep talking keep thinking keep looking for solutions yeah and keep writing as well you know for the, right. the, <laughs> to keep that kind of a uh, conversation going absolutely brilliant okay so we're coming to the end of this hour i think we could quite happily carry on talking but or listening to ben Reed, but we won't we won't make um <laughs> Uh, so that's been absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much, Bren. It's been a yeah, a great hour, and you it would be absolutely fantastic. <laughs> oh, thanks for having me. I've had a lot of fun. Totally. Um, and you're always welcome back as well. Um, <laughs> if anyone hasn't read Bren's books and wants to get hold of them, um, I'm going to just put up the details now. Obviously, you can borrow them from your local library. Perfect. But also, if you want to get a copy of yourself, because I know they are, and I have to say, I don't know, that they're absolutely beautifully um, designed covers and books. I mean, I know. Yeah, these know, are all Joe Hunt. Joe Hunt did all of them. Absolutely yeah. beautiful. Something that's really nice to have in your hand when you're reading. Mm. Wonderful. So, so if, you look, if you look closely, you can see the story. And then we can see that. You can pick which kid is which in the little crocodile on the boat. I'm trying not to turn around to look at my copy. The little shark. Yeah, I'm doing it. Yeah. And you can see, like, one kid has a shaved head, and that's Silesi, and <laughs> Neoma with the spyglass. Perfect. Perfect. I love that. Even, even more to Joe's, see. Joe's done a wonderful job. <laughs> so, um, I'm going to, yes, but want to get a copy of yourself then, so you two can uh, have a look at the cover. Um, yeah. So, the bookshop is uh, Reed in Home Firth. So, that's the address. I'm putting it on here, and obviously, you can come back and the, the, the show, the event will still be available for you afterwards. So you can come back and get the details if you need to. But the most important thing you need, and it's right next to the library in Home Fair, you can't miss it. Lovely for uh, And the code you need to use is this one. So this is CFDIBBLE20. CF double 20. Okay. And that's the code that will get you 20% off at Reed if you want to go and buy Bren's books, which I think is awesome. Yay. You're doing that. Brilliant. Brilliant. So um, that's it. If you want to, I've just got one more thing to show. If you want to go and have, find out more about Bren uh, yourselves, there's a website you can go and look at, which is lovely. There's lots more to find out about her life, which is, uh, she's had, oh, yes, she's done all sorts of things. We haven't even touched on here today. So, I've had a few um, disasters too in the last, in recent years. So it's been a, quite a wild ride the last couple of years. Wow. So you can check out the website to find out more. There we go. Um, <laughs> so it's at mcdibble.com. It's very easy to remember. So, yeah, so please do go and check. I'm just going to put this one back up again because I do think this is a lovely, lovely, um, uh, lovely forward to have in the beginning of a book and something to take away from today as well. So to everyone trying to live more gently on this earth, keep up the good work. I think that's something that's really meaningful to take away. I think it's lovely. Yes. Okay. Please do. So that. thank you so much, Brent. It's been awesome. Thank you, Brent. Um, I'm going to hand back over to Dave, who's going to tell us a little bit more about the Cosmia Festival and what's coming up. Um, because there's so much more that you can take part in, everybody. And then we'll come back and we'll say goodbye one more time. And thank you for Ben one more time. Okay. okay. Thank, thank you. you. Brilliant. Let me just bring this up for you, Dave. Okay. So thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Um, I've really enjoyed listening to Bren and her talking about this book. And you should definitely go and buy a copy or get it from your local library. Um, if you can't get to read in Home Firth, you can use the service The Hive, and then you can choose for the money to go to uh, read 
instead if you can't do it physically. Um, as Kirsty mentioned, we've got loads and loads of other things on as part of Cosmic Festival this year. So I thought I'd talk you through very quickly all of the stuff that we've got coming up. Um, almost everything is online, so you don't have to be local to us here in West Yorkshire in the UK. We've got loads more author talks courtesy of Kirkley's Libraries over the next seven or eight days, something like that, all the way through to next Sunday. Um, some really great authors to come, so make sure you check out their website or our website for information about those, and they're going to be in the same format as this. We also do our book clubs. There's a reason that I flashed up the book of Coley before. It's because um, I'm going to be talking about that book tomorrow morning, UK time, at about half past 11. Uh, it is another kind of set in a, in a post-apocalyptic climate change future story with a young protagonist, um, but set about 30 miles away from here in Huddersfield. So if you're local, there'll be a lot in here. You'll go, oh, I know where that is. It's very, It's really fun for that. <laughs> um, we have got expert talks from the University of Huddersfield. We have got some whimsy next Sunday night with some um, fantasy sci-fi authors. Um, and we've even got board games with our local board game cafe, The People's Meeple. So if you're a family that likes playing board games, on Monday evening, we're going to do a kind of board, ma- board game making class slash competition in person for families at The People's Meeple. So you should book to come to that. Um, And then most importantly, we've got loads of workshops for 8 to 17 year olds that we're running online as part of the festival with some really talented artists, um, theatre practitioners, craft makers. And the ones that I really want to highlight are creative writing sessions. We're doing four of those next week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday in the mornings with a award winning author, Jane Rogers, who's going to show you how to do what Bren has done and write amazing stories about the future and bringing in end of the world and climate change. Um, There's still places available, so make sure you check those out. Um, And also lots of other stuff happening, particularly on Monday and Tuesday, that uh, is really great. uh, And it will give you something to do during the half term, if nothing else. It's all free. It's all online. So head to that website address. That's cosmiafestival.co.uk slash 2020 slash programme for all the details. That's brilliant. Thank you, Dave. I'm just going to share some. We've had some lovely comments coming in. So I'm very just going to quickly share these just as we're finishing off. So we've heard from Reed, the bookshop in Home first, to say this will be brilliant this morning, which is lovely. Mm-hmm. Uh, old Barn Books. Uh, keep writing, Bren. And thank you, <laughs> all of you. And we've had one that's popped in using their uh, daughter's YouTube account, which I think will be saying thank you as well to us uh, for this morning, which is lovely just to share with us. Wonderful. Okay. So, um, like I say, thank you so much, Brian, for coming um, and joining us in Kirklees. We've really, really enjoyed it. Um, and oh, thank soon. you for having me. <laughs> always welcome back. Okay. It's like this. Wonderful. Okay. So we're going to say goodbye. Uh, do check out the Cosmo website. There's so much coming. There's some brilliant, brilliant authors yet to come. These ones behind me here are just some of them. And they've got some early years ones next week as well. So we've got some uh, under fives. We've got two really great sessions with some fantastic authors and illustrators they really should miss okay thank you very much everyone have a great weekend and stay safe bye-bye Thanks.